Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining in this session today. Uh, as David said, I'm Robin Mansfield. Uh, I work with children in site planning in a whole range of different areas, uh, whether it's post-disaster reconstruction, um, urban resilience, um, public uh, landscape architecture works for the government, um, and I'm also currently midway through a PhD uh, into research into children's participation in urban planning in very vulnerable settings. Uh, so this fits in very nicely with that and I, I'm really hoping that um, this assists in joining child protection and the minimum standards along with uh, the SPHERE guidelines um, and gives you all some sort of background and understanding as to how you can help impact uh, in this space. So I'm going to start um, with the goal for the day and at the, at the end of uh, my presentation we'll be taking questions. I've also been working with Tarek and Carmen to get a good understanding of what's going on on the ground um, and how the standards are used on the ground to ensure that this presentation is most relevant for you all. First of all, I have a very strong goal and belief that if we get this right, then there's the chance for children to leave these situations. Robin, and, uh, sorry, uh, yes. excuse me. Uh, Robin, there is like an echo and the voice is not clear. Can you try to be close to the mic and like, I don't know, please. Okay, I've got a headset on so I can hold the mic. That's better, uh, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll okay. hold the mic. Yep, sure. Uh, okay, so I have a very strong belief that um, in these situations, even though they're very, very challenging situations um, that children have experienced incredibly traumatic conditions, that we can help them develop a particular experience that leaves them with feelings of empowerment and with skills that are necessary to take beyond being a, an internally displaced person or a refugee so that they grow into empowered adults who are thinking about how they can then use those skills when they're rebuilding their country. So this presentation is very much uh, an aspirational goal about how we can use their experience in this environment to empower them and leave them with a positive mental and physical health status. To give you a brief overview of what the presentation is going to include, we're going to have a discussion about the policy, what the benefits of involving children in um, urban planning in these camp scenarios are, uh, and then we'll break it down into the different processes of urban planning to demonstrate how children can be involved uh, at each, each stage of the process and how you can think about how you might uh, bring them into each part of the process. Uh, it's obviously very challenging conditions, so I'm very mindful of the constraints that you're working under and the lack of resources. So this is very much geared towards uh, helping you find easy ways of involving children so that the more this develops over time, the easier it then becomes. I've then got some ideas on how children can be involved. Um, some resources when there are no resources, so other ways that you can involve them without needing uh, additional input. A few inspiration boards, including uh, one that has been uh, put together by a young person, uh, because it's always good to check in and, and make sure that it's hitting the mark even at this particular stage of proceedings. A few key messages, and then we'll go into questions. So in terms of the policy environment, the number one policy component that underpins this is the minimum start standards for child protection in humanitarian action, in particular standard 27 shelter and settlement and child protection. The principles that I'm drawing on to put together this presentation come from a whole range of supporting principles, including the Sphere Handbook, the Child Friendly Cities Framework that UNICEF put together, uh, it's very much used for permanent urban settings. 
However, the, the principles apply in these scenarios as well because it's all about creating the physical environment around you, whether that's temporary or permanent, the principles are still very, very similar. Uh, words into Action, which is a, a United Nations disaster risk reduction booklet, uh, which shows how children can be involved in trying to prevent further disaster. So obviously when you're in these um, difficult camp settings, uh, the, the camps themselves are, are exposed to um, very challenging physical conditions, uh, as I understand it in this particular case, you've got some real terrain challenges, but also weather challenges. So how children can be involved in thinking about how are you going to prevent uh, some sort of further trauma in, in situations such as when winter comes or if there's heavy rain, um, preventing landslide and things like that. There's also the child-centred urban resilience framework that again has principles that align uh, and so on. So there's a number of policy environments that all work together to help support that standard 27 of the minimum standards for child protection. The benefits of involving children in any sort of urban planning environment and at any stage of the process are enormous. The risks when they're not involved, uh, to give you a bit of a, an idea of some of the research that has happened uh, after a disaster, it, when children are not involved, it can leave them with a, a mental traumatic space that is very difficult for them to move past. So post-traumatic stress disorder um, can continue to manifest years later. Um, children are more likely to be drawn into uh, violent political groups um, or to be separated from their families. Um, they're more likely to uh, be susceptible to things like waterborne diseases or other physical impacts that harm their physical and mental health. So they're the consequences of not involving children. When they're actually involved in these processes, it has a very strong empowering uh, impact, which then lasts into adulthood. So it, you, will, you can almost think of it as children getting involved in preparation for when they're an adult and feeling like they have uh, a, a greater impact on their physical environment around them. It's also important to understand that children's experience of their physical environment is very different to adults. Uh, and it, it, it can be very easy for us to forget what it's, what it's like being a child when you're knee height or only a metre tall and you're experiencing this big imposing environment around you, particularly when it's a new environment, when there's been trauma involved and then trying to adjust to a physical environment where you can't do the things that you used to do as a child, where you're also surrounded by thousands and thousands of other highly traumatised people. So when children are actually involved in any parts of the planning of this space, it then gives them some sense that they have some sort of control over their environment in a positive setting. And those positive experiences can help mitigate some of the impacts of the trauma, but also create a space uh, where they feel like they are part of the place that's going on and that where they feel safe and that they belong in that space for this moment in time. In terms of the minimum standards, there's a very strong principle uh, around children's participation which talks about uh, and is connected to the Convention on the Rights of the Child around children being able to meaningful participate in all decisions that affect them. And this includes during emergency preparedness and response. So in this case, we're talking about their meaningful participation in the planning of the camp setting. Um, this principle talks about the positive changes that can occur and the impact of children taking on some of that responsibility, but in a setting where protection uh, is also first and foremost in um, 
the, this policy environment. So the protection of children is critical when looking at any opportunities for them to participate. In terms of under 27 point, um, standard 27 in the child protection minimum standards, there are a number of clauses that are very specific around children's perspective perspectives and consultation with children. So right throughout, what it's asking for in the shelter and settlement component is that children have a say in the decisions that are being made to put together this planning system. So starting with the first part of the process around planning and design, I think the most critical thing to think about here is even if, if you're not uh, sure of all the different ways that children can be involved or the sorts of decisions they might make, the very first thing to point out is to think about when you're making the decisions, what impact that will have on children and what might children have to say about this component of what you're working on right now. How will these decisions impact them when they're actually living in these spaces and how the spaces might change over time that continue to impact children. So some of the information here, which will be made available to you after uh, as a point of reference, for, for each part of it, the site layout. Is the site layout conducive to children finding their way to child-friendly spaces or if they're having to navigate the streets of the camp, uh, is it confusing? Are they likely to get lost? Does it feel child-friendly to them? Are there spaces where children can go and play? Uh, can they go and kick a ball somewhere and, and let off a bit of steam in a, in a safe place where other children can interact with them? In terms of infrastructure, is, is WASH infrastructure um, able to be accessed by children? Can they understand the signage? Can they understand where they can get water? Do they understand where they can go and wash their hands? Uh, are there areas where children can gather safely while parents are getting water or parents are using wash facilities? Um, in particular, do, do they cater for adolescent girls? Um, this is a particularly um, challenged group who are greatly affected in these types of scenarios. So does it feel safe for them? Uh, what are the waste systems associated with the wash facilities? Are there drainage systems that stop water from pooling um, and creating areas of mud where there's potential for waterborne diseases? In terms of mobility, um, are the streets easy and safe to navigate? Um, are there children with disabilities who are going to find it difficult to use streets that might be particularly rocky or muddy? Um, is there signage um, that is that children can understand so that they can navigate their way easily without feelings of being lost? And are there designated safe routes for children to attend school? Um, one of the um, research projects that's been done uh, on another camp demonstrates that the dropout rate of children at schools is really quite high simply because there is no safe route to school. And we also know that if children are in school, that helps create a safe space that alleviates a lot of the other flow-on issues from non-attendance. In terms of sensory, children are very sensitive to sensory type scenarios. Uh, so children like to personalise their spaces. They like to beautify. Uh, some of these um, opportunities can be really quite simple um, and uh, zero cost in some cases. And I have some images of examples of this. Um, again, another thing that has come out in some of the consultation that I've done is children gravitate towards greenery. So is it possible to have any sort of greenery? In terms of images, so uh, at an um, IDP camp 
in an area affected by earthquake. Um, the picture on the top left shows children playing in a drain. So children gravitate towards interesting spaces like drains. They love to play with water. They love to play with mud. So thinking about, well, if, if you've got open drains, uh, are children going to gravitate towards that and potentially be impacted by waterborne diseases? Um, street infrastructure, if, if it's difficult to navigate, if it's muddy, uh, if you've got pools of water, that can feel very intimidating or scary for children, particularly if, you're, if they're also sharing that space with vehicles. Down the bottom here, we've got an, uh, an example where children and women have contributed to the design of um, water uh, infrastructure upgrading in an informal settlement in Indonesia. Uh, and something as simple as coming up with different designs for their paths has actually made a big impact on that community as they've been able to represent their cultural identity in an area where generally they've had difficulty in doing that. In terms of how spaces are used and managed, thinking about what activities happen in spaces can be really important. So first of all, defining how spaces are used. Again, children are very sensitive to whether something feels like an adult space or whether it feels like a space where they're welcome and is it equitable. So. The actual layout of spaces and the identity of those spaces can either cause segregation or they can cause equity. So thinking about how that might be impacted is a really critical thing. Um, programming the use, simple things like um, a couple of times a week, having a sports game, even friendly sports games between adults and children uh, can really build up rapport. Um, Arts and crafts, again, it doesn't take uh, much in the way of resources to come up with creative ways of engaging children in some sort of formal use. And this can also double as uh, use as well. Parents are going and um, attending to their needs. Um, temporary installations are another example. Thinking about how the space is maintained, so building it to a particular standard is great, but then thinking about how that's then going to be maintained long term. Is it something that children want a bit more of a say in? Um, do they want to participate in that? And again, thinking about how do you also ensure protection so that children do not then become exploited in that and children are still empowered to decide how much they want to be uh, a part of that. And then monitoring and evaluation. Is there any mechanism where children can actually provide feedback about how the space is working for them? Because with all of our good intentions, there can be times where some spaces actually provide hazards for children that we didn't envisage or unintended, unintended consequences. So how can we ensure that children have some sort of mechanism for providing feedback on that space so that it can then be addressed. So examples here, um, wherever I travel in the world, and regardless of how dire a situation seems to be, there always seems to be a group playing volleyball. Again, it's very, very low uh, resource, but in terms of bringing together communities, any sort of sport, um, can be a real leveller, um, particularly when you've got sports that children of any age and ability can participate in in some way. In terms of uh, waste, I mentioned waste management in the um, maintenance of a space. In the bottom left hand side there, you can see that that feeling of waste in a street completely changes the feel of a space. Of, of the street and can make it feel very neglected and therefore unsafe. It can also result in disease or a lack of pride, which can also lead to destructive behaviour. Now I'm going to play a video of an example. I'll just... Now can you all see this?
Yeah, yeah I can see that, okay. So that's an example of a group who are using art in these types of camps to engage children and create programs. And I'll just turn that off. Sorry about that. And what they're also doing is using any funding they get to actually train adults in the camps to help uh, teach younger children how they can participate as well. So it's also creating employment opportunities. Uh, in terms of skills building, there's lots of different ways that children can actually um, learn from various different processes. So in terms of helping that those feelings of empowerment, but also having children think about what they might like to do when they're an adult and looking at income generation, there are lots of really good skills that they can learn. So even very small children can learn new skills, um, some things as simple as learning how to wash their hands properly. Um, young children uh, are really creative. Um, sign making, if you're looking at how to make um, wayfinding sign, signs uh, child friendly, while well, having children do the actual painting of the, the signs themselves and coming up with the designs uh, is a really good way to build skills and to have them involved in beautification skills, but also creating um, things that help them navigate their way around the camp. Um, there's, there's teaching uh, how to make cubby houses. That's another example. Um, Preteens, so older primary school age children, again, um, they, they can learn all these skills and teenagers themselves can be really, really great role models for younger children. So if you can um, find ways of um, helping teenagers build up their skills, whether it's how to teach younger children how to play sports or how to coach or even how to um, manage or budget for public spaces through mentoring, there's, there's a whole range of different uh, things that teenagers can be taught that will help equip them for when they're uh, adults going out into the workforce, but also to channel some of their energies that, that teenagers bring that um, can be channeled into positive energy. So some of the examples here uh, in the top photo, we've got um, young people teaching children how to play tennis. Um, another place I went to affected by earthquake, uh, younger children were learning skills like carpentry skills. So some of the children were not, were unable to attend school. They were being 
uh, drawn into the drug trade. And so some of the adults were teaching children um, skills like carpentry and dancing and performance to uh, allow them to channel their creative energy. And uh, this little boy in particular spoke with great pride of his carpentry skills. And when, when he was an adult, he wanted to become a carpenter. In terms of uh, beautification projects in this same community where there was a town cleanup and beautification project, the children voluntarily asked to join in and eventually uh, took over, uh, wanting the adults to, to stand back and let them take over once they knew what they were doing. They, were, they wanted that pride in their place back. Uh, and again, here's another example of where uh, children have been taught how to paint and have painted murals on the buildings in a refugee settlement in Uganda. There's lots of different ways that children can be involved. There's lots of resources. So if there's uh, more information that you're looking for, I, I can certainly pass on some more information to David. But there's, there's a few simple things. One is simply about thinking about each step of the process pausing and thinking about how can children be involved in this? What impact will the decisions have on children? They might not always be able to participate in some way, and if that's the case, then making sure that the children understand uh, through providing them with information about how their considerations have been thought of, they will at least then know that they are first and foremost in, in people's thoughts that they have not been forgotten, that they're not invisible in this process. This also helps to develop trusting relationships and helps to be able to then deal with any issues as they arise down the track. Meeting with children in their world at their level is really important. It's something that we, we can forget what it's like and getting children to take you on a tour of this space can be very, very enlightening and can help, can help generate an understanding of really simple things that can make their uh, connection with their environment much more positive. And thinking about how they like to communicate. Uh, if you've got highly traumatised children, they might have different ways of communicating that feels uh, more safe for them. Attendance uh, is a really good way of exploring whether or not there's an issue going on. So I, I mentioned before, children's attendance at school, if attendance is low, then exploring what the reason for that is, it, it might uncover something like access to school is not safe. And if that's the case, you can then work on um, fixing whatever issues there are that make that feel less safe. Um, looking at when are children attending things with their parents and if they are attending things with their parents, whether it's health uh, appointments or workplace um, or any other um, places that adults need to attend to, what are the children doing when their parents are attending these places? Do you need to consider um, aspects of creating child-friendly spaces in proximity to certain other spaces to ensure that families can stay together as much as possible. And even chats with children. And, and again, through all of these processes, ensuring that all the protection measures are in place so that children are not being exploited. But simple chats with children, just the occasional chat when you see them out and about, um, a, a few simple things around what do you think of this street or, you know, what do you think of your new house, those sorts of things can really open up all sorts of um, conversations with children that can be really helpful in developing the spaces. So a few examples here. Again, I mentioned earlier in, in a consultation session uh, that I ran with children in the refugee camp, it was... It, an overwhelming desire for any sort of greenery, whether it was growing flowers or trees. And the children said that that gave them hope when they saw something growing. Children are also 
uh, very clever. They're very good at understanding complex information from a very young age. So if you're able to communicate with them in a way that they understand, they will, they will be able to contribute to that. An example uh, on the lower left-hand side is a three-year-old in the refugee settlement that three of us went and spoke with uh, once she'd made us cups of tea with her uh, toy set. She then described about how she was the kid in the neighbourhood who looked after all of the stray cats and so when her mum wasn't around, she would leave meat in the window to attract all the cats. And then she said it, it made her feel calm if she could then pat the cats. And so the drawing next to that picture is her picture of the cats. And she was then able to tell us this story about how important those cats were. And thinking about children and how they navigate their environment, quite often in these scenarios, children will be looking after younger members of the family. And so they have to take on quite a bit of responsibility. And what that means is they really do understand their environment well. Now we're getting, we're getting near the end. So as I mentioned earlier, there's no resources. We understand that. So thinking about what you do have uh, at your disposal, you've got people with skills and capabilities. So what are those skills and capabilities and how can they help connect with children? What have you got in the existing environment? Is there sand? Are there rocks? Are there twigs and so on? Can they be used in some way? Waste, there's, there's going to be waste. Uh, and waste can be used in a whole different sort of ways. And you'll see some photos in, in a minute to um, give some inspiration there. Um, wash facilities are, are required to be installed. So is it going to be uh, child-friendly wash facilities? Is it uh, safe and easy to access by children? So here's a few examples. Again, uh, in the earthquake scenario, there were lots of taps that were talking about how the water that was available on the streets was not safe to drink and it was there for washing only, but it was, in, it was written. Uh, so it wasn't child-friendly signage. In terms of the different taps that you can use off the UNICEF website, there are several different taps. Some of them are easy to use for young children. Others, they have trouble turning the taps. So thinking about if you want children to be able to access water, particularly to wash their hands regularly, can they actually turn the taps on? Can they actually reach the taps? The image on the right shows an example of the sort of waste um, that you might find in a camp and how can that be used as a resource? So here's an example of where waste has been turned into uh, in this case, an elephant in a Ugandan camp. Uh, there were messages of sustainability through that and their connection to elephants in the local landscape, but it also played music. In terms of some inspiration, I mentioned earlier that uh, I checked in with a teenager on what sorts of things they think would affect them um, most greatly in um, this type of scenario and what sorts of things did they think that children might want to do. So ideas that were brought up with things like buddy systems between younger and older children to make it feel safer walking to school. Um, wayfinding, I mentioned that earlier, so what sorts of street signs um, can children make? Even numbers on tents and buildings so that children can find their way home children naming the streets or paths so they have greater connection to their space, um, colour coding tents or putting colour markings on tents. Um, one of the ideas um, was about communal bicycles, finding a sponsor to provide communi um, communal bicycles to make it easier to get around toilets. So again, that, that one's listed as a high resource uh, opportunity but from time to time there are sponsors who want to contribute something to these types of scenarios. Activities in open space like mini Olympics, regular sports games, outdoor communal meal, meals, um, outdoor movies. Again um, kids are pretty savvy with technology these days. All you need is the wall of a tent and um, a, a mobile phone and you can create outdoor movies um, and again the growing vegetables. And another idea was mailboxes at each tent so children can leave each other messages. So that was from a child. 
In terms of using waste, um, here's a number of examples like um, using bottles to create walls or, or gardens, um, creating play toys for children, um, but also using uh, waste to actually beautify some of the fences and barriers around the place that normally would look quite intimidating, but as soon as you start to use the waste and attach them to the fences, it completely changes the feeling of the space for children. And a few more ideas here again, using bottles, toilets and how they're designed and how they look and feel is really, really critical. So if children don't feel safe, they're not going to use the facilities in a, in a safe way. So there's lots of examples where children will then um, defecate outside the building or on the floor of the building because the toilets themselves don't feel safe. Um, and there are lots of ways that have been tested to make it feel um, safer for kids um, or to have waiting areas so that if, if uh, a parent is there with three or four children that while the other children are waiting they're actually in a safe space where they're not going to disappear. Again playing sport, making sports equipment out of waste and uh, an image of the, the sort of buddy system that you might have. So the key message is from this when, when planning the layout of a camp the four key messages, children are the experts in how they navigate their new environments. So thinking about how you can tap into that expertise uh, is the starting point for involving children. Thinking about each step of your process and the impact of the decisions on sh both short and long term development of children. Thinking about how the camp is actually going to function and what's this going to feel like to children of different ages and um, children with disabilities and thinking about overall what the long-term impact of this camp and its layout and the process of design and implementation is going to be on their long-term development into adulthood. All of these things will help give inspiration to different ways that children can participate in the planning of the camp and the long-term functionality of it. So thank you, I'm going to hand over and Carmen and Tarek are here as well, um, who can also add any additional mes messages um, to do with child protection and how that connects with uh, this presentation. They're also here. Thank you, David. Fantastic, thank thanks Robin, thanks so much. That's um, uh, incredibly inspiring and also something that I think we can all learn from in terms of um, uh, site planning. It's in uh, in involving uh, children and um, the the spaces and uh, you know, great great presentation. Open up the floor for questions. I um, saw one in the chat uh, just earlier uh, from um, Mercy Corps. Um, Muhammad, uh, do we have guidelines for uh, children children's wash facilities? Like we they we have um, guidelines in terms of. Um, uh, disabilities and so forth. Are there any specific guidelines for for wash facilities, toilets, etc., in with our children in the camps? I'm just wondering if um, Carmen wants to answer that. Um, there, there are um, there are some okay. guidelines Sorry. for child-friendly spaces, but uh, yeah, I might I'll have just, to I'll just, I'll just unmute Carmen. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry, Carmen. Let me unmute you. Um. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's the host who who needs to unmute all of us when we speak. I believe that's the setting of the of Zoom in this in this uh, meeting. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Robin and David, for for inviting us and uh, for this very relevant um, initiative. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, come. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, um, what Robin has presented is is, is quite comprehensive and, and very encompassing of the of all the aspects that we need to consider um, from a child protection perspective. In regards to the uh, to Mahmoud's uh, um, question, 
do we have guidelines? Uh, well, we do. We do have guidelines, uh, but more than guidelines, what we use is the standards uh, for this particular um, for this particular interaction between wash and child protection. I would actually recommend uh, stand uh, on the child protection minimum standards that Robin had uh, had shown on the screen. There is one very practical and very uh, um, focused uh, chapter that relates to uh, child protection and wash and it gives us uh, guidance on how wash actors and child protection actors need to work together um, it's in the, it's a standard 26 if i'm not mistaken uh, you have the same exact composition for shelter and cccm camp coordination and camp management i think these are the three standards that are very relevant to what uh, we're discussing today. Have a look at them. They're very pragmatic. Um, they're very focused and pinpoint the, the main aspects that we all need to know when uh, delivering wash interventions or shelter interventions or CCCM interventions in regards to child protection. If you still want to go deeper and you have time to read, I would. Uh, um, I strongly encourage all to have a look at last year's IESC guidelines on inclusion of persons with disability in humanitarian action. That's more focused on adults and children with disabilities, both. Yeah. And then and that was 2019 is the IESC uh, material. And then UNICEF has one resource as well, very focused on this, which is called um, escapes me now but i think it's called including children with disabilities in humanitarian action it's two three years ago that uh, that was published super relevant still to everything we do uh, please have a look at that it's a unicef resource uh, i think for 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 the parting uh mahmoud and all the colleagues uh, here who might be interested interested have a look at the standard 26 uh, to start with 26 27 and 28 as I said, very pragmatic, very hands-on on everything we do. So I hope that that helps a little bit, um, Robin and David, uh, for that question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Carmen. Sorry, thanks, Carmen. Um, it's um, I, I I really um I really encourage you to um you all to have a look at the um the uh, minimum protection standards. Um, it's a uh, Certainly, um, certainly opened my eyes when I was when I was certainly re when I was reading through them as well. Um, any any more questions? Um, uh, it's um, I think we we do have uh, when we've got Tarek and uh, Carmen here from Child Protection. Robin can um, uh, also answer answer questions as well. Please uh, uh, raise your hand in the um, in the uh, and we can um, we can unmute you and you can ask accordingly. Uh, I'll uh, well I'll I'll um, also continue I'll continue the ball rolling in in terms of that uh, Robin just in terms of the um, uh, that notion of the uh, child friendly uh, space that we all uh, hear a lot about and the um, the uh, association of the child friendly space to the women friendly space and so forth and also mm -hmm. um, uh, possible open other other open spaces um, you know there, I suppose there is a lot to consider in terms of uh, the location of those and the design of those spaces rather than them simply just being a um, a, a rectangle on a plan um, mm. have you got any got any more thoughts on on, on those yeah absolutely so uh, they can be fairly simple but their lo location is really critical as is the access to them and the visibility into those spaces. So nat natural surveillance, so to speak. Uh, in terms of 
how that space is divided up to cater for different ages, that's also something else to consider because smaller, smaller children or particularly traumatised children are going to want to feel safer with uh, their backs to something so that they can see and quite often children who've experienced trauma want to be able to watch other children play without actually joining in. Uh, when, when a space is closed off too much, it can actually cause um, antisocial behaviour um, if it's not visible to other areas or if it feels like a space that can be um, taken over by one particular group of people that can feel very unsafe, but that can also create a space where um, unsavoury behaviour occurs. Part of that can be dealt with through the actual programming of that space. So if it's a space where there's constant activity, but with um, trusted adults participating in some way in that space, in a way that works for children of all ages, that also helps. So it's not just about creating uh, a big space for kids. Um, it, it's got to have that little bit of extra thought in there and programming has a really big impact on it because the memory of how that space is used, it's been shown to stay with people so that it then encourages similar sorts of behaviour when people come back to that space. But also being able to get to that space means you'll get a much broader range of people using it if, if they've all got access to it. Does that help answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. And thanks for that. Just, just a, a follow-on question from that. Um, teenage uh, spaces as well, and um, how mm. the how, how teenagers are re interact in the camp. Um, uh, any any thoughts on any additional thoughts on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, it, it, teenagers can be really tricky because they, they can deal with these scenarios by withdrawing um, from adults and trying to um, create some independence. Um, there can be lots of anger uh, that comes out of a result of um, things that have occurred. Uh, so involving teenagers in um, helping them mentor younger people or engage in um, productive behaviours can be really, really important. So getting them involved and um, helping them develop their skills and empowering them in some way. So thinking about how can they be given um, decisions to work on amongst themselves that's, that's actually going to end up with a positive result can all help bring back the, um, these feelings of having some sort of power over what's going on around them. Um, look, teaching, teaching younger children um, can have a really, really positive impact. So when you talk to children about the sorts of areas that they want to play in, while adults think about wanting to separate children of different ages, the children themselves don't necessarily want that and quite often they'll ask for spaces where they can interact with children of different ages. So thinking about what that works like, again, if you're talking to children about that and really drawing some of that information out of them, quite often they're the ones who will come up with solutions to that. So, uh, you know, talking with young people, you know, teenagers and, and younger children and really drawing that out. That's, that's the key thing here. They're the ones who are going to have the ideas and you can help facilitate those ideas and get them thinking about things a bit differently as well. Fantastic. That's, um, that, that is really helpful and really, um, uh, really inspiring. Um, are, are there any other, are there any other questions? I've noted that in the chat that uh, Carmen has provided some links to the um, uh, to various documents. Um, uh, please av avail yourselves to those. Uh, it's um, uh, the the standards in in terms of the uh, the shelter and child protection standards and wash standards. These are incredibly important. So um, so please 
uh, download those documents and, and read, read through them as well. Uh, please, are there, are there any other questions um, uh, to do with uh, planning and associated with children? Actually, I'm going to continue the ball rolling as well because I find these topics fascinating. Just, ju ju just, just one, one question to um, to Carmen. Um, in terms of the uh, role that that uh, CCCM has to play uh, in this, are you able to expand on that uh, a little bit? Uh, where are we? I have allowed people to unmute themselves, so she can unmute herself. Yeah, uh, Carmen, if you could unmute. J just the, 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 the question, Carmen, just in relation to um, uh, the role that CCCM has to, um, has to play in, um, in uh, the role of, of child protection as well. Just, just, I know we're talking about shelter, but just, just briefly on, on CCCM. Okay, yes, I could unmute myself now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, no, indeed. I mean, camp coordination and, and camp management partners are, are very key and very crucial as being in, in front line, sometimes to the uh, um, most vulnerable families and, and, and children, and therefore they are we rely on, on, on them as well uh, as, as a first source. Uh, we understand they're not protection actors and I don't think anyone is expected to, to do everything everywhere. And, and that is normal. That's why we work with clusters and the cluster approach and a structure. So for, from our partners in CCCM, what I think is um, very, very um, beneficial for, for both of our clusters is that um, when they are in the front line, in, in CAM design, they'll start from day one, when they design their CAM, if those considerations are taken on board, um, it will have a long-term impact on, the, on children, well-being, and, and overall family staying in, the, in, in these CAMs, in this setting or in this reception center. So from day number one, the design is important, involving children from the very early stages. Um, we already have uh, camps that are ongoing since, uh, since years, and there's a structure in front, a way of working. Um, what is important in those settings as well is the uh, actual referral to protection. Uh, when the CCCM partners come across a family situation or come across to a vulnerability emanating from a child. Um, what is important for them is that they are able to identify it and able to refer that child and know where. Um, in many of those settings, we do have protection partners. We do have uh, either GBB partners or child protection partners or both. Um, so that, that that actual contact uh, and interface between one cluster and the other takes place. Um, today, the child protection subcluster, we are aware of very few uh, referrals that are happening from camp management to child protection actors. And um, we would like to see these uh, more fluid and, and more ongoing. Uh, as we build, because uh, in the past we do get referrals from the health sector, from education especially, we do get quite a lot of referrals from their side, but I would say perhaps on the CCCM is something we haven't seen um, so prominently. So perhaps it is a, a matter of awareness as well, of knowing who is available and where, and knowing what each of us is doing and the value that we bring. And, uh, uh, and actually actioning those uh, referrals. Um, no one is asking um, a health partner to be a child protection expert as well and vice versa. And no one is asking a CAM management agency to be a child protection expert. Um, so that is why we work together. And uh, when you come to a situation of children in need, just don't hesitate, just find out who in your area 
uh, uh, is there from child protection or from a protection partner and make sure the child and his, his or her family are receiving the, the, uh, the assistance they need. That would be uh, in a nutshell how we would like to operate um, the intervention that is valuable in, in uh, complementing each other. Especially our, our co management partners are at the front line um, uh, of, of, uh, of displacement. And, and we know when there is displacement, uh, there are protection concerns. This is uh, fortunately, this always goes hand in hand. When there is displacement, protection issues are either aggravated or newly come up. So, um, unfortunately, that's the, the certainty that, that we have in, in our context. Over from my side. Uh, thank, thanks, Carmen. Again, that that's uh, very very insightful and um, and much appreciated. Um, and I again really am really uh, thankful and grateful for uh, both your your uh, time and commitment and Tarek's time and commitment to this uh, presentation tonight is very much appreciated. Um, has there been? Is there any other questions um, from from any of the uh, uh, part, any of the uh, participants, any of the uh, NGOs that are online tonight? Please type them in your chat, or you can unmute unmute yourself and um, and and um, and uh, ask Robin or Carmen and, and Tarek. Well, if there's if there's no more uh, if there's no more questions, um, we might um, we might just uh, uh, draw a close uh, to the evening tonight. If there's no more questions, and um, again, I'm just very thankful to uh, Robin for the presentation tonight. Uh, ch involving um, children and the the consideration of uh, children in in um, developing a uh, a settlement plan is incredible is incredibly important when you when you think when you, when you think that you're um in in a sense developing a, a plan for a a settlement that is not going is not just for a couple of months we're, we're talking about a, at least a few years in um a five ten sometimes um i know for example in um uh two refugee camps that I worked in Nepal, those refugee camps had been there for 25 years. Mm. So you're, you're, you're developing a, a um, uh, and with the, and with the concrete block uh, shelter settlement settlements that we're talking about, you're develop, going to be developing a, a, a settlement that, that is long lasting. So in terms of an overall urban design um, thought uh, and an overall urban design over, uh, consideration to your site plan is incredibly important. That involves considering children, considering spaces, green spaces, um, uh, the, the, the whole, um, the, the whole, you know, get, uh, um, all of that, all of those uh, things could t work together really well. So uh, again, I'd like to just like to thank Robin for her time tonight and um, Tarak and Carmen for being involved as well. Thanks, David. And I've just added a couple of free resources um, that people might like to download there that, that give a few ideas about how to go about this. And your point that these places uh, can sometimes uh, be around for years means a lot of the principles in these documents that I've um, shared there are, are relevant. Uh, even though they they set out to be temporary, they do stick around for a long time. And some of those photos of um, the refugee camp that I was in are in a refugee camp in Gaza, um, and some of those settlements have been there since about 1947. So, you know, they all start out as temporary, but to to continue to treat them that way and not think about the urban environment on children can have very devastating effects long term. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Robin. And um, uh, again, please, any uh, if any of the uh, participants have got any further further questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me, and um, I can uh, certainly um, uh, pass Robin's details on to you if that's okay, and um, uh, you can uh, ask questions offline. But again, thank you very much for all your uh, help. Very much appreciated. Um, if uh, there's no more questions, um, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, good night. And we'll, and just in regard to the presentation for next week, um, we had we had mentioned that it was going to be on quantum uh, GIS, uh, but the uh, uh, Andrea will be uh, hosting a, uh, a further session on global mapper and looking at flood analysis and um, how to uh, flood analysis in more depth uh, using the global mapper software. Um, so uh, please, um, uh, you you have the links up. So please uh, come along to that one. That'll be also um, very informative. Um, Again, so uh, thank you all and uh, uh, good night. Uh, good, good, good afternoon, I should say, in your time, but good night <laughs> in our time. But, but again, th thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.